well, who wants, to, who wants to find it? It's there. It's like a religion, you know? It's there for anybody who wants to find it. possibly experience it all. It was something that was unfathomable. You know, you couldn't, you could do, go there and you could have fun, but there were always lots of fun left to have, no matter how long you stayed or how, or how soon you ran out of money. when uh, Colin Mooney and Dennis Kearney set up a tent city there and had dance halls and horseshoe games and dart games. They were the first ones that actually used it. But long before then, the Indians considered that, that area sacred. But I think it's because it's a very high negative ion count there because of the vision of the, the waves over those rocks at the foot of the, the cliff house, which gives to a spirit of freedom and, and lack of uh, oppression and feelings of well-being. The last day was September 20th, 1973. That was the day before Labor Day, I think. And I'd cut the article out of the newspaper that said 10,000 people visit the Fun House on the last day. And I thought about my five kids never being able to go and see Playland again. And it just brought tears to my eyes. I really, I just, I just, I just had these real feelings of loss because I could never go visit some Laughing Sal again. I could never go through the light in the dark. And I was already saving stuff. I was saving stuff for a long time because I, I was saving things that were important to me and I felt had some kind of cultural importance. I've been a salesman all my life. I spent, I've made enough money in, uh, in sales to support my family and buy a nice home, but it wasn't a whole lot of fun. And I decided I should do something to have fun. And so Playland became the thing that I was going to go after and uh, have fun doing. But at that time, Playland had been torn down. I knew in my mind that anybody who had ever been to Playland had an interest in the games and the fun and the freedom that exists in a, in a carnival atmosphere. And what I said, we wanted to do a study on the concept of play and what it meant. And we wanted to learn just as much for ourselves as for anybody else. <laughs> Playland at the beach, to me, was experienced in a very innocent kind of mood because of my girlfriends going there and having fun as a as a, uh, a mark, which is what they call a person who spends their money in, in a carnival or collection. So I spent that money trying to win to and it was exciting and fun for me. But the most important part about uh, our being together at Tenant of the Beach was after it started to get dark, we'd go over to the beach and park in our car park in my little car and watch the sunset and I put my arm around her and, and we'd, you know, uh, make out and this was called in those days and uh, we'd get a little closer to that ultimate uh, conclusion of uh, making out each week. But I never, I never ever uh, experienced the ultimate with this lady. And had I, I probably wouldn't have such an interest in playland at the beach. But I would never want it, see. She never got it. I'd won the teddy bear and she might not have gone with me the next week. I don't know, I didn't realize that then. Well, I, I ran away from home when I was young, um, between 16 and 17 years old, I joined the carnival. It was one that came through town, and when it left, I went with it. And uh, it was a very exciting time of my life. 
when I started in the carnival, of course, I, I wanted to be, wanted to do my magic act. And when I, when I left home, I took my magic stuff with me. But uh, being a uh, bit shrewd business people like the Carnies are, I ended up being a ticket seller for a long, long time. For about three months, I was selling tickets in front of the sideshow. I learned a lot of stories about the carnival. I learned that people used to pay to have my job because they could shortchange people and make more money doing that than any other job in the carnival. Finally, the, the yoga guy that used to pick up the log with his hair and walk on glass, he, he uh, uh, got sick. And so they, they let me do it. I took his place and I did my magic act in, in his place. And uh, and I was pretty good at it, too. I, I, learned real, I learned real fast. We did as many as 18 shows a day. The man that hired me, probably one of the greatest fire eaters in the world, taught me the, the tricks of the trade, so to speak. And he was good. Most people, when they learn, when they eat fire, you know, they they know that that, that stuff is hot and they're going to get burned. So they do it very cautiously. And this fellow had he knew he'd been doing it for so long, and he used great big torches, and the fire was huge, and he held it in his mouth for an unbelievable length of time, and it just burned out. But he he'd have been doing it for so long that he was fearless with the fire. He taught me uh, how to eat fire, and. Uh, I worked on it. It was the ultimate. Yeah, it was, it, it was the adventure of it and the fact that it couldn't be done. It was, it was a, there was a magical kind of uh, 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 quality to it, which was not uh, trickery, which was real, because you actually put that fire in your mouth and you shove it down your throat and you blow it out and it comes out and people see it and it's visual and it's real. And uh, there's no the illusion is the reality of it. What you're seeing here behind me is the last remnants of Playland up the beach. This building was built in 1950. It shows the whole area magnified on a giant parabolic screen. It goes around real slow in a circle and brings things up close so you get a real good look at what's happening right now. You see the sea lions out on the sea rock and the surfers in the water and everything around here. The funds that are earned here at the giant camera go to help support what's left of the playland at the beach down there. We're trying to gain the north lot. But one last piece of property that's not slated to have condominiums built on it is still available for the public to gain. Unfortunately, it has a low priority. Uh, when you do have time to go and you find out playland at the beach is now condominiums, that's when you'll think about it. And in a few generations, people will say, I didn't even know they were going to build those things. Why? If I knew, I would have stopped them. They're terrible. The spirit of Playland is an innate thing within all of us. And it was certainly rejuvenated at the condominium auction because of the, the, the free drinks and the, the mingling crowd and the excitement of somebody getting something at a bargain price. Uh, just like Playland, somebody wanted a teddy bear. So the spirit was alive in that respect. The, the masses going in different directions you know, rubbing shoulders with the elite and uh, not so elite is it was a playland uh, phenomenon, if you will. The spirit of playland is alive, and I want to feed that spirit and provide people who who have an innate interest and curiosity about it. They should have some access to. Uh, information about it. Few people can afford to spend their time doing studying on something as inconsequential, although it plays a big part in our lives, it still is of little consequence compared to bread and butter. There's a, a real breakdown in our values that can be overcome by just doing it, only doing what you want to do, even though you don't have the funds to do it, perhaps the way you'd like to. A lot of the things you want to do cost you a lot of money, but you don't do it anyway. I, I, I don't do anything else, hardly ever, unless it leads directly to doing something I want to do.